We're going to be talking about suicide prevention, and um, it's going to. I'm excited that you're here, and really quickly letting you know that <clears throat> here in Arizona, it's nice and sunny and warm here in Mesa. I don't know where you're all at, but welcome again. <clears throat> um, this topic of suicide prevention is a very delicate topic, and uh, I want to go over some things first. Of, first of all, with um, some of the world's um, worldwide suicide standings here. So really to understand suicide, let's first of all look at it from, the, from, a, from a worldwide perspective. As you can see on the screen, more than 800,000 people die from suicide every year. Many, many more attempts of suicide are made, which many times go undocumented. Uh, suicide in, was, in 2012 was the second leading cause of death among individuals between the ages of 15 and 29 in 2012. This is from the World, uh, the World Health Organization, and it was the 15th leading cause of death overall in 2012. Next slide, please. Okay. As you can see here in the United States, the suicide, here it says suicide is, it was in 2012, I believe, that suicide, no, 2014, excuse me. Suicide was the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Each year, 42, in that year, 42,773 Americans died of suicide. And for every suicide attempt, 25, um, for every suicide, 25 attempts were made. And suicide costs in that year, the, it cost the U.S. over $44 billion annually. And the probably cost is more than that. Now let's bring it down to the American Indians, Native Americans. As you can see on the chart, it's very overwhelming that when it came to suicide the, that year uh, of 2012-2013, uh, uh, among the uh, Caucasian population, the white was 24.8% of males that, uh, that committed suicide and 5.5% females. But the black population was 14.7 for males and 3.1% for females. Hispanics was 12.9% males, 3.2 for female percent. And the Asian and Pacific Islanders was 13% male and 5.2% females. Now let's look at Native Americans. It jumps all the way to 34.3% for males and 9.9% for females. That's astonishing. That's amazing what is taking place. And so you can see suicide is a real problem. Looking at some of the headlines from, from some national publications, one reads, Native American youth suicide rates are at crisis level. That was the Huffington, the Huffington, Huffington Post in 2015. Suicide rates high among young American Indians. That was a Time Magazine in 2015. Suicide among young American Indians nearly double national average. That's the PBS NewsHour in 2015. The hard lives and high suicide rates of Native American children on reservation was the Washington Post head, Washington Post headline in 2014? Okay, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about some of the warning signs that 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 many of you probably already understand, but I want to go over them very very quickly here. It, this will help us to understand uh, more of the reasons or more of the causes for suicide and what can we do with this. Some of the warning signs and symptoms. First of all, suicide, suicidal thoughts are real. They really are real and can be one of life's most difficult trials, not only for the individual but for the families also. When the stress and pressures of life seem unbearable, a person's thoughts and reasons can become greatly distorted, leading them to feel that death is the only option. And this becomes a real a distortion in their minds of what of what takes place. In other words, death is really the only way to go. 
Now, the next thing I'm talking about is that the behaviors listed may be some signs that may be helpful to someone who is considering, you know, be helpful to you and cons for someone you may know who is considering suicide, who is thinking about it. And that is one. Someone talks about wanting to die or wanting to kill themselves. Another point here is feeling over, overly depressed, hopeless, and having no reason to live. Point three, looking for ways or means to kill themselves. Four, feeling trapped with no real solutions to the problems or the burdens they may be experiencing at the time. The next, another one here is withdrawing from family, friends, and community. People tend to withdraw because they really don't feel they're connected. Next, another point here, feeling that there are, feeling that they are burdened to others and would be better off dead. I'm a real burden. I don't know what else to do except to take my life. Another point, there's an increase, increasing bad and reckless behavior. This is another warning sign that you can look for when they increase and increase bad and bad and reckless behavior. Another point, another sign is increasing alcohol and drug use. I think most of you can see that. Another one, saying goodbye to family and friends. When they start to point out saying goodbye in their own little way, that should be another warning sign too, and they have no plans to go anywhere. Next, another point here is feeling anxious and having a dramatic mood change. One day, one hour, they're happy. Next hour, they're crying, and they're, it's just it's just a big like a big pendulum going back and forth. I made a special note. Not everyone shows warning signs of suicide, though. So you really got to be vigilant in trying to examine and look for some of those signs. When I've worked with people who have uh, wanted to commit suicide, this has also been a common thing that I've found in working with people, and that is they often hear voices in their heads saying things like, you want to die, you should die, and the next step is, you have to die. Now, these voices are real to them. Okay, but and on the same token, the person is, they are begging, they are, they are begging, okay, you're begging yourself not to go through with this act of suicide. Because I don't think no one really wants to die. But, but, but they just get to the point where they feel they're hopeless. Voices, these voices to them are strong. They're convincing that you, that, that, that no one really cares for you. These are some of the things that I have experienced in working with people that I've had that, have, that are considering suicide. <clears throat> now there's a wide range of emotion, there's a wide range of emotional pain that these people experience. One of them, which is a big one, feeling disconnected. And they think, others do not understand me. They don't understand my pain and they feel disconnected. When you feel disconnected from particularly loved ones, that really has negative impacts on any of us. But we don't feel like we, we can connect with people that are significant in our lives. Another one of emotion is that uh, depression combined with hopelessness can be overwhelming to you, to people who are thinking about suicide. Depression combined with hopelessness. Another one do not know how to get out, out or escape. They really feel that there's a dead end and, and they don't know how to get out or escape this thoughts and misery. Another one is close in, they begin to close in on themselves spending time alone. Because again, like I said, that's finding find it difficult to connect or communicate with others. Another point here is they push others out of their life. That's just kind of a standard thing they do. They begin to push or exclude people from their immediate circle, like family and friends. Another point here is feeling that life is out of control and my life is out of control and it can't be fixed. That's a problem many times they feel that's, that's what's going through their heads. And they're hearing voices say these things to them. Now, when you recognize these symptoms and behavior in other, 
these, when you recognize these symptoms and behavior in others. We want you to help them recognize that there is a life in a world outside of themselves. That's one of the things you can start to do is to say, show them that there's a life in the world outside of their misery. That's going to take time. I'll get to that in a minute. You help them understand that you help them understand there are people that really do care and love them, wanting them to be safe and happy, wanting them to be successful in life. One thing really important here is when you, when you communicate these things to the people, you must be truthful. Why? Because there is nothing more powerful than truth and love to a person struggling with life. These are things that you people really need to understand, that there is nothing more powerful than truth and love in this personal struggle. Now, moving along, what can you do? What are some of the responses and reaction to suicide? What are some of the responses when somebody takes their life suicide? Suicide of loved ones can be devastating experience for family members and close friends. I mean, they can really devastate. Your whole thought process you're living is devastating. The grief can be profound and intense. I have found that really to people that have lost loved ones in suicide. Some reactions may include, they may be angry or feel guilty. There's a shock and there's a disbelief. Why did this happen? Why could it? And it really begins to a shock and a disbelief why this could happen. Because many times we think our loved ones would never do this. There's a shame or a humiliation that people feel because their loved ones have done this. That's a common feeling. I'm ashamed or humiliated because this take, because of suicide took place. As a result, they, be, they begin to conceal the real cause of death. And this is common also because people want to think other things happen besides suicide. People begin the feeling of abandonment and neglect. You know, you feel you, you have been abandoned because of this took place. A common occurrence is that you begin to blame yourself, others, or even the creator. If there really was a creator, a loving creator, God, why did, he, why did he allow this to happen? So you begin to blame yourself, punish yourself, or others, or even the creator. You begin to isolate and withdraw from family and friends or even society. It's a common occurrence where people begin to withdraw because of the suicide that took place in their, with their loved ones. People are consumed with deep despair to, to know and understand why. You really want to know, why did they do this? What caused them to do this? And sometimes people are consumed so much that they do things, they just go to the full extreme, but why did this happen? They're consumed with a deep desire to know and understand why. That can cause issues too to individuals. Another one is thoughts of suicide themselves or self-destruction to join the deceased. I'm going to follow that person that committed suicide. I'm going to I want to be with that person. Those are some common, these are some common responses and reactions to suicide. I know I, I wish I could explain them more, but we just don't have the time. Now what can we do? As an individual, what can we do? I point out here, understand no one can can completely know the full circumstances that cause the suicide. Now, you may assume a lot. You may try to reason this out. But no one can completely know the full circumstances of why the suicide take, took place. There's a wide range of things that many times we're totally unaware of. So what I would suggest you do is this, if suicide has taken place, is this, avoid judgment or placing blame. It is not our place to judge or place blame of why this took place because we don't understand the full circumstances that caused the suicide. Point number two, 
honor and respect each person's unique grieving process. Because I look at grieving as this, grief is only an expression of their love. So some people grieve more intense than others. Some grieve longer. So respect each other's, each person's unique process of grieving. Point number three, ask how you can, how, ask how you may assist or help during this difficult time. Reach out and ask, how can I help you? Can I be of assistance? How can I do that? Because at times are difficult and many times people are reluctant to ask for help. Point, point number four, stay connected with the family and friends reaching out to support. We want you to stay connected. We don't want you to avoid them. We don't want you to put them, put, put them aside, but we want people to stay connected to family and friends who are going through the grieving process or the questioning process. Why did this happen? Next one, I tell people this. You need to turn to the Creator through prayer. And I tell them, why? Because prayer is the heritage of our native people and is an integral part of our culture and spirituality. And I think it's the cultural and spirit, a component of many cultures out there, not just native cultures, but we, I, I, I seriously urge people to turn to the Creator and ask for guidance, for strength, for assistance, for understanding, whatever thing you need to, to ask for. And I say, why to the people? I, and I just have to remind people, the natural order of our native ways, this is the natural order of how tribes, native people have done, is to help one another, to watch over one another, and to comfort one another, particularly during these stressful and difficult times. This protecting care, care circle of care and understanding will help us overcome adversity so we can look forward to a new day. I really believe that. And I also say this, adversity is part of life. We're all going to have to experience different kinds of adversity. And we tell the people this, look at, look at adversity this way. It's an opportunity to become reacquainted with the Creator. Why at this time? Because your heart is soft and it's tender and it's seeking answers that are difficult to answer. So I'm saying adversity is an opportunity to become reacquainted with the Creator. Our Native forefathers understood the power in this and I'm just passing it on. Okay. Now let's look at the family. How does it look at the family? I want to take a little bit different twist to suicide prevention that a lot of people, uh, I'm sure some of you also follow. And that is, let's look at our families. Family is the heart of Native American people or our cultures. Family is our heart. Some people think it's the language or it's the traditions, it's the food, it's the customs. Those are all wonderful things that we want to preserve. But really, the heart of who we are as a Native people, it's family. Therefore, we say there is nothing more important and precious than family. And when you lose a loved one, you really understand that at that point. Because lives are crushed many times. You're not, your life is crushed when you lose a job or if, if, if somebody breaks into your house. But when somebody, when, you, when, when life is taken, it really becomes stressful and difficult. And that's why we say there is no other work more important than fatherhood and motherhood. Because they have to take the lead in keeping families together during this stressful time of suicide, of death. And we say our greatest happiness and greatest sorrows comes from our relationship with our families. And that is so true. Now, let's take a little bit of a twist to it. Have you ever asked the question, what is happening to our families today? Under remember, remembering that suicide among our people is so great. What is happening to our families today? Ask the questions to yourself. Are they strong and lasting or are they fragile and breaking apart? 
do we need does does it need to be fixed and where do we start now denying and ignoring this problem is becoming so common until it directly affects us so we need to ask ourselves what is happening to our families today now some of the families it is so common now our families are being broken up they're being scattered they're being rejected family members feel this way when feelings of rejection sorrow loneliness fear hurt anger and resentment set in it is easily transformed into personal chaos and chaos turns to rebellion disobedience complete confusion and dysfunction because when you're rejected it really hurts and goes on it just really impacts us individually so much in chaos it is easy to abandon our goals and principles and also neglect our duties and responsibilities as parents as siblings the entire family and community often function in the various states of chaos and maybe you've seen this maybe this is kind of common in your communities when individuals families and communities function in different stages of chaos this is what you will see and that is gossip rumors lies rebellion and disobedience because life is upside down and so you can start to see that one of the big areas of, of prevention is we need to strengthen our families and here at our program we look at we start with strengthening fathers and mothers because that's really where it should start with fathers and mothers we want to show them the importance of their role as fathers and mothers and I say this now because of the cause of so many problems on on our Indian country we say that we say today our great native cultures are quickly moving towards becoming a culture of rejection it's years ago we could blame the government or different religious organizations or different agencies but today I think we have to take responsibility what is our role as fathers and mothers okay like I said we are quickly turning in towards becoming cultures of rejection due largely to parents laying aside their most important duty to their children and to each other loved ones loved ones are being left behind and left out because of selfish reasons we need to open the eyes and the ears of our fathers and mothers this rejection may lead to self destruction when you're rejected you start going down the road of self-destruction. Today, many of our children are starving for affection, for recognition, for safety, for acceptance, and just leadership from their parents. If we could get parents to take on their rightful role as leaders in their families, I'm a firm believer that many of our social problems and ills would drop dramatically and suicide is one of them that would drop very very drastically now here at our program it's called native american father and family association this is our philosophy and our approach in working with people who are going through difficult times of distress and sorrow and we say this in our efforts to help and assist people and i'm talking a lot of also to the professionals I've taught at three universities. I've taught over my over my over my career, and I've never seen this in any of their curriculum. And I say here, often in our efforts to help and assist people, we often move away from two important and necessary elements, and these are the things that are absent in our approach. And that is, I say, you must truly love the people whom you serve no academic says that they say if you're a professional you can't love the people I say if you work with our native people professionals and I'm talking to native professionals too if you work with our people your first requirement is to truly love the people whom you serve it's critical 
because you can tell if somebody doesn't care for you in the first few minutes of your talking with them. And I don't care if you have a PhD or if you're a full-blooded Native American, if you don't like to love the people whom you serve, they will feel it. And your degrees, your race, your culture becomes meaningless. Now, why do we say love the people whom you serve? Because it is love that it builds trust. It starts to heal people. It repairs relationships. It strengthens self-worth. It bonds and unites families, friends, and communities. Point number two, you must love what you bring to the people you serve. You must love your job. You must love what you bring to them. Now, I know I was a therapist for a long, I started being, I was a, a clinician, I started my career back in 1971. I worked with a lot of people over these years. And there's a lot of things I didn't like doing when I was a therapist. Like, I didn't like all writing all these process notes and all this documentation, but that's part of the job. For an example, let's say a mother, I've never met a mother that just, let's say your kid throws up all over you and you have to clean yourself and clean your child. I've never met a mother or father that says, oh, I just love it when my kids throw up all over me. But that's part of the job. You must really love what you bring to the people whom you serve. Love, and I say why? Because love is the power that motivates, inspires, and initiates change. It is a start of respect, tolerance, and understanding on the part of the practitioner. It helps overcome diversity, prejudice, and misunderstanding. That's why I said you must truly love what you bring to the people whom you serve. This is essential in strengthening the desire for positive change and the need for a, for a successful life. Now, precisely, this is what you do. The first things you must do is truly love the people whom you serve and love what you bring to them. If you can do those two things, I tell people, you are halfway there. Now, when the people come see you, precisely this is what you must do. The first thing you must do is uplift the people that come in. You must uplift their spirits, their attitude, their self-image, their self-worth. And when you do that, you make people feel welcome, wanted, needed, even special. That's our real, that's our real native way. That's what we have to go back to. Now that you've uplifted them, you have their attention. Now the next thing you do is that you encourage them. Okay, there's a process you go through in, in encouraging. But one of the things about encouragement is that you strengthen their hope and you bring them new hope. Because some people come into us, particularly ones that are really considering, considering suicide, ending their life. All they have when they come in to see us many times is just a little bit of hope and nothing else because they've burned so many bridges over the past that all they have is a little bit of hope. So it is our responsibility to strengthen the hope they come in with and to give them new hope. This will inspire a desire for change and give confidence and trust in themselves and other people. But that hope is critical. Then after you encourage them, we say in this, you must then assist them in helping them recognize opportunities, identifying resources, improving their life skills. In other words, you help them solve, you help them with their problem solving ability. What I mean by that is this. We just remind people that all life is, all life is every day of your life, every hour of your life, you're going to have to solve problems. A little problem is like, where is the restroom? To a big problem like, I was fired, my wife left me, or whatever happened. There was, a, so there was a death in the family. All life is, is one process of learning how to solve problems. Now, when you stop solving problems, we just remind our people, when you stop solving problems, you now become the problem. 
because somebody now has to take up your slack and solve the problems that you're not solving. And you can become a burden if you don't solve your problems. But one of the things when you solve problems, it just means you are responsible and you are mature. That's a, that's a, that's a point of maturity, the ability to solve problems. I've been to funerals where many times people come to the funerals drunk and it starts a whole chaotic mess because they're not able to solve problems. They've never been taught how to do it correctly. Then after you have uplifted, after you have uplifted people, you have encouraged them, you have assisted them, now you can teach them. Because now they not only have your trust, but they have your confidence. And what do you teach them? You teach them principles, responsibility towards family, fatherhood and motherhood, and other things. But one of the things you teach them, you teach them to help them recognize what is true. Now, when we come across people who are struggling with the loss of a loved one, we must do everything we can, everything we can to fill their life with hope, gratitude, and understanding. Even I work with mothers and fathers who they come to me with just tears in their eyes and they say, my son and daughter are going down the wrong path of life. What can I do? They won't listen to me. I said, then let's do this. Let me work on strengthening your hope. You must always carry hope for your family. Why? And for your loved ones that are going, that's going down the wrong road. Why? Because someday your child may be at the bottom of the barrel, at the end of the rope, whatever you want to say, and needs hope. And they may have to come and borrow some of your hope. The other thing you feel their life is gratitude. When people are really grateful, they begin to change. And this is real, I tell people, this is Native American 101. We are a grateful people. When you're grateful, you change. In fact, have you ever seen people that are just bitter? They're just angry all the time? If they do, if, they're, if you have people that you see that are like that, are just bitter about everything, you can rest assured one of the things is this. They're not very grateful. They think they're entitled to things, but they're not. you got to work for what you get. But gratitude is powerful. Now, the next thing we work on is trying to have people become more understanding. Because one of the biggest gifts you can bring to any and all relationship is the ability to understand. Because when you understand, you're more tolerant. You don't judge. You don't condemn. It doesn't mean you condone their behavior because now you understand. Then it gives you a lot more things to work with. So that's what I mean by that. you got to fill people's lives with hope, gratitude, and understanding. Let's go to the next part. One of the things we do in, our, in working with people precisely, we work really on someone's self-worth. Now, <clears throat> this is different than self-esteem. Self-esteem is related directly to your level of confidence. And self-esteem can go up and down because we're not always confident in everything we do. But self-worth should be consistent. And so we work on people's self-worth to understand the true nature of their own personal values Worth, usefulness, productivity, and goodness. Understand the true nature of who you really are. Okay? A very large degree of our worth is tied to three things. How we are treated by others, particularly individuals significant in our, in our lives, like family and friends. How, how do they treat us? The next one is how do we, how do we respond to the way we are treated. You have a lot of, this is a, this can be a really a strong point for you because if you keep responding the same way, people will still keep treating you the same way. So we try to work with them and say, let's figure out, let's work with you to develop skills so you don't respond the same way that you respond differently. Because when you start responding differently, 
people will start treating you differently. And the last way you get yourself, another way you get your self-worth is how useful are you to others? If you're really useful, people need and want you around. It doesn't mean that you're weak or people take advantage of you. It's that you are useful to so many people. And I say, you must love and value your own self-worth. That is critical. Self-worth is the foundation of our ability to believe in ourselves. You can see why we spend a lot of time and energy working on someone's self-worth. It puts and keeps people on the right path of life. It brings confidence and the ability to cope with the hardships of life because we will have hardships. That's what life is all about, learning how to solve problems that come from hardships. It maintains strong relationships. It's directly related to a sense of self-worth and confidence. You can maintain relationships that way. With strong, healthy, and positive self-worth, you know what happens? You are never hopeless, which is one of the biggest causes of suicide. With a strong, healthy, positive self-worth, you are never hopeless. I think you can see why now we work a lot on someone's self-worth. Positive self-worth begins in the home. That's where positive self-worth begins. But if father and mother are absent, it's difficult because now kids have to walk alone in life, and that's tragic. And I tell people that I go to a lot of prisons, and I tell the people in prisons this. I say, I'm going to tell you something that you probably won't believe, and that's this. You are worth more than the worst mistake you have ever made in your life, and that is the truth. Parents can turn their lives around and become more responsible people. And when you do that, people will want to be in your life, even children you have abandoned. So we want to work on people's self-worth. You are worth more than the worst mistake you have ever made in your life. We work also on attitude because that really impacts suicide. The power of your own attitude. And we say attitudes are powerful. They are often referred to as the power of one. That perhaps is your most powerful weapon as a person. Okay? Your, your attitude can 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 draw people towards you, loved ones towards you, or you can push you away, push them away. Your attitude is powerful. And some people have a very, very poor, bad attitude, and they wonder, what's the problem? I hate to tell them, but hey, you're the problem. And there are some people that have a really bad attitude, and they don't see that they're the problem. This can be in the family, this can be in the workplace, this can be in the community. So attitudes are powerful. And I say this, there is nothing, and I literally mean nothing, in this world that will have, that will have greater impact on your happiness and success in life more than your attitude. Not your culture, not your gender, not your education, not your age, not your looks, not your wealth, nothing more than your attitude. So we really work with fathers and mothers and how do we strengthen and improve your attitude because that is so critical. And we see attitude greatly affects your ability to learn and understand, particularly about yourself and your potential. Some people are so closed-minded that they can't learn very much. They just can't because their mind and heart have shut off and they think they know what they're doing. These are the people that think they know it all and they just they have they struggle. Even with keeping friends. A proper and positive attitude can help you in these areas. Overcome challenges and rise above trials. It can also help you be happier and make to make good choices. It creates joy and peace in your life. It you can perform your work more effectively. At the job, if you have a good attitude, you will perform your work more effectively. And co-workers will want to be with you and will even assist you. If you have a bad attitude, they'll wish that you fail because of your attitude. It puts other people at ease. It puts family and friends at ease with a good attitude. Attitude. Now, this is an important part here. Attitude is more, impart, more powerful than your past than your failure, than your education, culture, and money. 
or even your accomplishment. So we really work with the fathers on that. Then we work with them and mothers on hope. And we say hope. Why hope? Because everyone needs hope. Hope for yourself, your family, and your community. Hope must be grounded, though. It must be grounded in truth, or it can be destructive. You think about it. If people give you hope, but it's based upon lies, people will, will literally jump off the edge. That's why when you truly love the people, you'll want them to give, give them hope that is, based, in, that is based on truth. Because there are so many lies running around, going around, that people don't know who they can trust. Without hope, we will bring, without hope, we will bring misery and destruction to our families. It is critical to have hope, always. And we really work hard on that one. When you lose hope, we tell them, you will doubt yourself. You will then want to quit, which will lead to failure. There's a direct correlation, connection, between hope and gratitude. When you are grateful, you know what happens? You are never hopeless. Say myself, say a word. When you are grateful, when you're a grateful person, you're never hopeless. Now, there's a direct relationship between um, gratitude and hope. Now, let's talk about gratitude for a minute. Are you grateful for what you have? How much time do I have? You're good, I think. It's 1022. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry for that. I don't know how much time I have. I don't have a watch on or whatever. So uh, now let's talk about gratitude. Why is gratitude so important? Because gratitude inspires and motivates people. It leads to happiness. It makes what is great even greater. Helps us develop greater devotion to our families. It leads to forgiveness, which produces more gratitude. It shows a deep appreciation for life. When you're really grateful, you show a deep appreciation for your life. It helps recognize the beauty in our world, in your world. It is a true and real expression of love. When you're really grateful for somebody else, it is a true, it is your true expression for love you have for that person. With gratitude in our lives, great things will happen. We develop understanding and strength. That's why we look at now. I'm just teaching you what our people really believe, the importance of gratitude, because gratitude is so powerful. They even say this, a grateful man is a smart man. When you're grateful, you're just flat out smart. And that's what I'm saying. When you're grateful, you're not, you're not, you're not miserable, you know? And so now let's look at gratitude and humility. How does humility play into this thing? Our forefathers put a lot of value on a humble person, a person with a lot of humility, because they saw the power in humility. A humble person has patience, is full of love, is quick to apologize for their mistakes, is hard to discourage. The opposite of courage is discouragement. So if you have a, if you have humility, you are hard to discourage. Understand the need for personal development. You will see I need to develop my talents myself. Humble person helps, cares about, care, helps, cares about, and teaches others. That's what comes from humility. Great understanding comes from humility, and it is a characteristic of true leadership. We did it. Let's have a look at our leaders right now. Are they humble people? No, they're not. They're proud and boastful and arrogant, and that goes on both sides, and I'll be very honest. I shouldn't bring politics into this, but that's the truth. <laughs> when gratitude and humility work together, it is life-changing, and change comes quickly. In other words, if you can give me, if I can give you, try to envision with me. If you could turn off all the lights in the room, you know what's in the room. It's dark in there. And if I tell you to walk around this room, although you know what's in there, it's just a matter of time before you bump into something, knock something over, or something's going to happen because you can't see where you're going. Now envision this. 
Now you flip on the lights. You can see very clearly what's in front of you, what's behind you. You can read things. You can see the colors. Now I say this. When you combine humility and gratitude together, gratitude and humility acts as an explosion in your life. It turns on the light and you can see clearly and focus, making life more meaningful, rich, and powerful. And that's what I mean by that. So what we do in this program, I, I'm a therapist and I usually do all those things, but I just work on some basic traditional things of our people. And that is looking, trying to make a person become really grateful and humility. That's important. And let me tell you what I, I will give you a little story of humility. I was born and raised on the reservation most of my life. And when I was a young boy on the reservation, I used to herd sheep with my, for my grandmother. And I used to hate it, but I had to do it. I tried to hide from my grandmother, but you can't hide from grandma. She knows where you, she can even smell where you're at. She can't hide from it. But I had to herd sheep every day. I rode a horse every day, summertime, herding sheep. Anyway, one day I got up early that morning and I saw my grandmother outside praying. She had her corn pollen. And now what they call it, that's what they call it. And she was praying with us before the sun came up. And this is what she said in her prayer. And when I heard her pray, I thought, my grandmother is not playing with a full deck. There's something wrong with her. Because you know what she gave thanks for? She gave thanks for the sunlight. She gave thanks for the air. She gave thanks for the water. She gave thanks for the food, and she gave thanks for Mother Earth. She understood something that I didn't understand at that young age. She understood her nothingness. She is literally nothing without sunlight, air, water, food, and earth. And so she thanked the Creator for these things because she understood her nothingness. This is what I mean by humility. When you really understand you need family and loved ones to support you, each other. And that's one of the reasons why the, I feel the biggest reason, one of the biggest causes of suicide is that a lot of our children walk alone in darkness because they don't have the support, the love they need that they demand from parents. That's why we spend a lot of our energy trying to try to strengthen the role of fatherhood and motherhood. We don't condemn them for their mistakes because we all made mistakes. And that's why you may recall, I say, you are worth more than the worst mistake you've ever done in your life. We don't place judgment. That's not my place to place judgment. Now, getting back on with suicide, we also tell people this. <clears throat> That I, I have personally worked with over 400 tribes throughout North America. Probably more like 500 tribes I've worked with. I worked with tribes all the way from Prince Edward Island to, to Alaska, all through I've been to all the provinces in Canada, and a great majority of the tribes here is up here in, the, here in the United States. And every tribe I have been to, they believe that when you die, there is life after death. This isn't religious. This is cultural. We believe that there is a, that life continues after death. There's different versions of that, but they believe it. This belief runs deeply in our heritage, in our native heritage. One common belief is that people, after you pass on, you re, you have a great reunion. You reunite. You you reunite. We have unity. You meet your forefathers again. You meet your loved ones. And we say this, when you die, there's, there's three things you take with you and three things only. One of them is you take your knowledge. You'll still know what an airplane is. You'll know what a microwave oven is. You'll know what a cell phone is. You won't forget that. You also take your relationships. You know who your parents were, <clears throat> your grandparents, your friends, your brother, you live and know your enemies. And the third thing you take, you take your shame or your honor. And I like to liken this, if you were, if you had a
family member that went to the armed forces and fought at a, at a, at a at like say like in Iraq, and they came back and they were honorably discharged. When they come back, they share their honor with you. If they deserted their posts and deserted their fellow man, they were court-martialed, and they when they come home, you're still happy to see them, but they bring some shame, and you got to share share that shame with them. I tell our fathers and mothers, we want you to become honorable men and women. So when you meet your forefathers after you pass on, we want you to bring honor to them and honor to yourself. Why? Because that's the real native way. And suicide is not honorable. When you come, when you work with those now, again, we don't judge them. But we say, we want to tell the young people that suicide is not an honorable way to meet your forefathers. Building and maintaining strong relationship in our families is important and key to success in all aspects of our life. Our existence and happiness is dependent upon building and nurturing strong relationships. I'm reminded now I just have about five minutes left. I want to look at our forefathers for a minute. They could teach us a lot. We need to learn and understand what they stood for. Okay? carrying out their sacred duty of putting family first. We've got to go back to that and putting family first. They will be, if we listen to the voices of our forefathers, they will bring inspiration and, spiritual, and give us spiritual strength. Give thanks and appreciation to our forefathers for all their sacrifices and for all their, what they've had to do throughout, the, throughout these years. If it wasn't for our forefathers, we wouldn't be around today. You say love and honor them. Keep their spirit alive in you. And preserve their wonderful natural ways of loving life. To love a long life and a good life. Not just to live, but we want you to live a long life and a good life. Death should never be a golden life. Why? Because we're all going to have to go there. So death should never be a golden life. We want you to live a good life and a long life, an honorable life. Why? Because you're special. You are even precious, precious, precious. You are priceless. You need to understand that we tell the people that we work with. One last comment here is this. If we can imagine, just imagine, that our forefathers would talk to us, what would they say? Imagine what our forefathers would say to us today. You know what they would do? They would probably shout at us. We are here with you. We know about dark days. We know about pain and suffering and sorrow and hard times. Help each other. Care for each other. Comfort each other. Believe in yourself and believe in your family. And feel our and and each other and feel our spirit keep our spirit alive and putting family number one in your life i want to thank you i think that we work together as an organization as organizations to strengthen our families i think that's the real key of suicide prevention because no one really wants to take their own life they really don't they are pushed in that situation where many times they feel hopeless that no one really cares the most people that should care are our fathers and mothers for the welfare and safety of their children and their loved ones. In conclusion, I just want to say this, that we uh, well, want to thank some of our sponsors, which one of them is Cook, uh, is a Cook Native American Ministry Foundation. They've been very gracious. In fact, they're the only organization that has ever put, given us money. We've never got any money from any federal agency or state agency or any foundation. Cook Ministry, I appreciate you. I applaud you. Well, we have a 13th annual, uh, our 13th annual national conference is coming up in here in Tempe, Arizona. It's going to be on uh, no in November. Uh, the dates are on this flyer, though. It should just be in November. November 2, 3, and 4. And this is how to contact us if you want to contact us. Um, Can you a few minutes for questions? Okay, we have a couple of minutes for questions. So if you can ask questions, go ahead. I'm new at this, so you're going to have to bear with me. We're going to ask questions if you have any questions. I guess you got to write them down. Yes, you can get a copy of the presentation. Yes, you can get a copy of the presentation if you want. 
to send us your information. And uh, I just put this presentation, I just finished it up 30 minutes before the presentation. So there's some parts that I left out, but that's okay. Any other questions? Well, I hope you enjoyed it, and I wish you a wonderful day, and I appreciate every one of you for tuning in. And if we could ever be in assistance, we would, I'd love to do it. And again, I really would like to, like to welcome you to our national conference held here in Tempe, Arizona on November 2, 3, and 4. Have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.